<laughs> so it is our third discussion on disputes, which is similar to the one on anger, really, isn't it? But this is even more exciting because it involves other people. <laughs> and of course, anger usually comes up in relation to other people. You can sit down on your own and get angry, but normally what you'll be getting angry at is something somebody's done to you to make you feel a certain way that you don't like the feeling of and you reacted to the feeling. And if you try and sit back, it's contact somewhere along the way, usually contact with another person not always but usually and if it's not contact with a person it's thoughts about contact with a person and that manifests itself usually as a sensation or a feeling or an emotion that we then take umbrage with my mom used to say I was taking umbrage <laughs> when I was young don't take umbrage it it's a very funny word isn't it it's like kind of get kind of sulky with something uh -huh. yeah don't it's take umbrage great. but it's kind of being in contention with experience um, because a lot of the time that's the situation we're in contention with it we don't want it we argue with it we try to you know rationalize it away or um, justify or blame or all different kinds of ways we wriggle away from the experiences that we find uh, disagreeable so if we're not in disputes with others we're in disputes with ourselves. but this is talking about uh Another way that disputes can arise. So we're now on page 133 of this wonderful book. And this is one of the parables from the Udanas, actually. And I don't often read the Udanas or um, those kind of more poetic aspects of the suttas. I tend to stay with Majima, Diga, and Guttu and Samyutta uh, because they generally tend to be earlier and possibly more authentic, but there are parts of these as well that are very likely to be authentic. And this one does look quite similar to the language and the kind of background stories that generally happen throughout the main suttas, because this is uh, situating the sutta in Savati in Jaitas Grove and Atapindika's Park, which is a place that the Buddha um, actually lived in for, was it 12 years in Jaitas Grove? Something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, 12 vassas. Yeah. 12 vassas, yeah, he may have moved between yeah. the vassas, but in those days they used mm -hmm. to spend at least the rainy season in one place and the rest of the time they would move around and, and teach uh, because in the rainy season you were more likely to injure little animals and worms and things and it would be harder to get arms food, I'm sure, and it was a time to just quiet and down like we will as well in just a couple of months or a few weeks. Anyway, so I want to read this one out. It's uh, very interesting to show how we can quarrel when we don't have the full picture, which is pretty much all of the time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so this is called the blind men or the blind people and the elephant. So on one occasion, the blessed one was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. Now at that time, a number of ascetics and Brahmins Wanderers of other sects were living around Savati. They held various views, beliefs, and opinions, and propagated various views. And they were quarrelsome, disputatious, wrangling, wounding each other with verbal darts, saying, the Dhamma is like this, the Dhamma is not like that. <laughs> you heard that? Happened before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then a number of monks entered Savati and arms round. Having returned after their meal, they approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and told him what they'd seen. The Blessed One said, monks or monastics, wanderers of other sects are blind and sightless. They do not know what is beneficial and harmful. They do not know what is the Dhamma and what is not the Dhamma, and thus they are so quarrelsome and disputatious. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Because you notice the strong language the Buddha's using. People think, oh, the Buddha, he was compassionate. He always said it's all the same. So many of us like to say, well, you know, the Christians have the same view, really. They just talk about it in different language, and really we're all talking about the same thing. But actually here, the Buddha's using pretty strong language to say that the, these wanderers in particular were blind and sightless. 
So he was actually calling it out when it was justified. And uh, there's another sutta I like that's, I think, in the section, I forget which section, it might be on training, further back in this book. And it talks about um, the importance of praising what's worthy of praise and dispraising what's worthy of dispraise. And that's very important, but it obviously takes discernment, okay? So the Buddha <laughs> has that discernment. The Buddha can obviously say this with some certainty. But I think it's also interesting to show that part of why he can say this is because they're quarrelsome and disputatious, right? So maybe it's that being quarrelsome that proves, in a sense, that you're not actually following the Dhamma at that time. Even if you have, maybe, I don't know, even if you have a right view, but still, you probably won't fall into so much quarrelling if you do. Because part of right view is learning to uh, say what's appropriate and beneficial. And I think quarrelling is very rarely appropriate or beneficial. You can disagree, but when it becomes a dispute or a quarrel, it's very rarely productive because somebody's simply not in a fit state of mind to listen and you're not really in a fit state of mind or you're not offering a good enough example to be heard. But I think it's interesting because the Buddha does use this sort of language and um, we can presume he's being objective and he's not coming from a place of defilement, obviously. So then he continues to explain why this might be the case that they're quarrelling and disputatious, and this is the lovely simile. Formerly monastics, there was a king in Savati who asked his servant to round up all the persons in the city who were blind from birth. When the man had done so, the king asked the servant to show the blind men an elephant. To some of the blind men, he presented the elephant's head. To some, the ear. To others, a tusk. The trunk, the body, a foot, the hind quarters, the tail, or the tuft at the end of the tail. And to each one, he said, this is an elephant. Maybe that's a case of true but not right. Like I just tried to say it's true but not right, or it's right but not true. <laughs> it was an elephant, that little piece. When he reported to the king what he'd done, the king went to the blind men and asked them, what is an elephant like? So you can imagine. Those who'd been shown the head replied, an elephant, your majesty, is just like a water jar. Those who'd been shown the ear replied, an elephant is just like a winnowing basket. So I checked with Venerable Pekka, we're like, what's a winnowing basket? But I don't know anyone who's been to Asia, there's a kind of basket made of reed or something with some small, small holes and they put the rice and they kind of shift it about so all the kind of husk from the rice falls through. It's a bit like a sieve, yeah, but it's kind of flat. Those who'd been shown the tusk replied, an elephant is just like a plowshare. Well, I don't know what that is, but you can imagine it looks like a tusk. <laughs> and those who've been shown the trunk replied, an elephant is just like a plough pole. Those who've been shown the body replied, an elephant is just like a storeroom. <laughs> I won't say what. <laughs> and each of the others likewise described the elephants in terms of the parts they had been shown. Then saying, an elephant is like this, an elephant is not like that, an elephant is not like this, an elephant is like that. They fought with each other. They mm. fought each other with their fists. Mm. And the king was delighted. Mm. Even so, monks are the wanderers of other sects, blind and sightless, and thus they become quarrelsome, disputatious and wrangling, wounding each other with verbal darts. There's a lot of food for thought in this, isn't there? <laughs> and one of the things that sticks out to me straight away is that in a sense, what they were saying was true as far as it went. It was their experience. So they could say, but this is what I've experienced. Mm -hmm. But the point was, it wasn't the whole picture because they didn't have the full faculties available to them. Right. And how many times do we think we're seeing something clearly, but actually our full faculties, in other words, the mind without the hindrances, <laughs> yeah, 
it are not actually available to mm. us. You know, it is our experience. It really is our experience that this person hurt us or upset mm. us. You know, and they did say this unkind word, but we're not seeing the whole thing. You know, how much of that is influenced by what we expected mm. them to say, the intention we ascribed to what they said, which they may not have had a bad intention at all, right? Or maybe the mood we are in at the time. Sometimes they might have said that thing and we'd have taken it very differently, given them the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we might have just laughed or shrugged it off, you know. Other times we might think, yeah, you know, that's kind of funny. I, I did do that. I'm such a clot. You say clot? <laughs> I'm getting all these old words. Maybe I've been called these in my past. <laughs> but, you know, you only see part of the truth. So even though it appears true to you, it's not the full picture and it's very distorted when you take that to be the full thing. Whereas the other thing, I remember, was it going to you that's, or maybe Ajahn Brown that said, if you actually put these things together, these, uh, these various descriptions, you know, this thing has a water jar for a head with a plow pole sticking out and a winnowing basket on the side. And it has this like storeroom in the middle and I don't know, a tail like a brush then if everybody sticks those definitions together, it actually looks pretty much like an elephant. <laughs> but because we don't actually talk, yeah, yeah, we just yeah. argue and say, no, it was a tail. It was a, it was a, what's it, a whisk or something. Yeah. Or no, no, it was a, definitely a winnowing basket. I definitely felt that it was a winnowing mm -hmm. basket. Then we don't actually come to a complete picture at all. Mm -hmm. But what if those people spoke together and discussed their findings and thought, OK, well, this is true for them. Let's put it together and like, they draw a picture. It'd be really cool. And then they realised that, yeah, there was some truth in everybody's statement. And actually, we're so much richer when we share the full picture together. And maybe it shows how much we're missing out, you know, when we quarrel, because we just adamantly refuse to hear another perspective, don't we? And I'm sure we've all been guilty of that. I know I have my views about the damn and I'm quite happy with that, to be honest. <laughs> because I have, I suppose, already looked at other views that I felt didn't quite make sense and had it confirmed by my teacher. But still, how can I know that's the right view unless I'm really seeing the Dhamma? You know, how can I be so sure? Like, mm. It's how I understand it with faculties not fully clear. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons, isn't it, that the Buddha says, you know, uh, that mm -hmm. samadhi is the cause for seeing things as they really are, because samadhi is the state free from hindrances. It's not about you've got to bliss out so you can see the Dhamma, you've got to get this jhana, that jhana, and I've got bigger jhanas than you've got. It's the fact that there's a method for overcoming the five hindrances, and it's only when you really can enter the deep samadhi that you know those five hindrances are at least temporarily put aside pulled aside and your vision is likely to be true not definitely not definitely because there's another wonderful talk called illusion that I love by Ajahn Brahm it's one of the early Reigns talks and he says you know the problem is that even then you might not see the truth as it is because delusions already been operating your thoughts your views your perceptions have already been twisting things and this is why we need the input of a Buddha the input of right view so that we have a chance to actually see things in line with that. And I think that's also mm -hmm. why he's saying that, you know, people from other sects are blind and sightless because one of the things that they don't have is that right view. That's one of the big differences um, to me between the Buddha's teachings and the teachings of any other um, prophet or seer or what do you call this? Like mystics, because there are mystical experiences in every tradition, but unless that you actually understand that what you're to look at or, or the basic nature of things is impermanent suffering and non-self. And unless that conditions you to look in that direction, then it's very, very likely you're going to presume that you're now having union with God or whatever. Um, and you can read about that in all these near-death experiences when the mind leaves the body and people have like this blissful, peaceful, most held experiences that they've ever had and they feel like they're going to the source and you know and then they sort of see God or however they expect to however they kind of personify that experience or visualize that experience is what appears to them so it's tricky isn't it <laughs> and it just shows that 
what that's at that you, level but at this level perception yeah, that, yeah. That, to, uh, very much sunk in the mud right how little we can trust yeah. our impressions how serious we take our impressions and how sure we are that we know what yeah. we are thinking especially yeah. thinking yes if we think right. it, it must be right it must right. be right and it feels so right yeah because you wouldn't think it if you didn't think it was right. You don't intentionally think a thought that you think is wrong, right? <laughs> yeah. So we always think our thoughts are right somehow. Or sometimes, mm -hmm. I mean, I've noticed for myself, because I can get quite sharp, especially after a lot of meditation, and my thoughts seem really smart. Right. And then I can kind of get lost right. trying to figure something out. It's not even mm -hmm. like I try. It's like the thoughts just keep coming, and it's like, wow, wow, wow. Right. You know, that's mm -hmm. also just old mm -hmm. stuff. It's in a way just mm. old stuff. And but then, I, yeah, yeah, the, the 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 mind that is uh, still not free of the hindrances mm. until it's yes. free of the hindrances. I can that you are, uh, it is free of the hindrances. It is not entirely trustworthy. Yeah, that's right. It's not yeah. trustworthy. Yeah, it's not trustworthy. Yeah. Yeah. But the Buddha also said Dhamma Vitaka is one of the last obstacles to mm. the meditation, mm. like the um, thoughts about the Dhamma, because you can give yourself a brilliant Dhamma talk, you know, mm. when your mind's very clear and very still. People <laughs> are smiling. I'm sure you've done it too. You give yourself this brilliant Dhamma talk. You see things so clearly, you know, and then you realize, oh, whoops, I was just getting quiet. <laughs> now I'm giving myself a Dhamma talk. Work everything out. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, I thought it'd be a nice thing to discuss some of this already because um, I think this is also very much about perception and, you know, perceiving things in ways that may not necessarily be not only the full picture, but maybe um, that leads to dispute. You know, can I, I wonder if I can use an example that Matthias told me earlier today. I think he won't mind. But sometimes language it's really interesting, like, because he said to me today he was in the kitchen and, and I think either Theodore or Matthias was cooking something and then they said something like, one of them asked, oh, should I cook it this way or that way? And Matthias said, I don't care. But then he meant, I don't mind. <laughs> but because of language and because of maybe sometimes, I don't know, not quite understanding the full thing, that could sound like, you're not giving the other person any help or you actually don't give a what's it or, or whatever. So these little things, you know, when we don't actually see the full picture of where someone's coming from or what they mean can, if we're not careful, or if we uh, jump on it too fast, mm -hmm. lead to an issue. And I'm pretty sure that nothing led to an issue here because everybody's practicing. But uh, still, the importance of actually... Mm -hmm being clear in our communication and and not necessarily the first time around but discussing and feeding back and being careful to mm -hmm. set things straight when we uh when we're not sure if our words landed well and he wanted to do that so he's I've done that for you Matthias but he wanted to do that you know just to make sure because these little things can sometimes niggle us can't they if we're not sure how it lands <laughs> so it'd be very interesting to open this up and ask for some uh, maybe personal examples or um, thoughts around it of uh, maybe how we can learn to doubt in a way our perceptions or maybe train mm. our perceptions also to be a little bit more beneficial for us, perhaps. And there is something in the um, box. Do you want to read it? Okay, it's from Shirley. She said, oh, sorry. The video. No. Okay, it's from an unknown person. It's from an unknown Shirley, but she won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a clear and simple simile. When I was at primary school, I read a poem that someone had written on this parable, and it made a deep impression on me, even as a small child. I never forgot it, but I still often think I am right and the other person is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah it's just not enough is it to yeah. know this intellectually yes yeah. i mean we're primed as animals if you like as just human being uh to survive so of course we're going to fall on mm. so many different 
mechanisms within us you know to mm -hmm. kind of show us where we're safe and where we're not and mm -hmm. one of them is kind of trying to work it all out intellectually so that we get the picture you know okay this person's like this this person's like mm -hmm. that if I go here I'll be safe if I go there I won't and we mm -hmm. try to work it all out for our survival really mm -hmm. I mean it's very very deep to be told not to think is absolutely terrifying for many people and actually people can't really do it right Unless you feel incredibly safe in the meditation, I think it's one reason Ajahn Brahm and I do it too, sort of encourages us to focus on the joy of peace and the joy of silence. Because if you don't, it can actually open up into something of a scary void. And it's kind of a gradual getting used to the mind without thoughts or the mind with less thinking and being able to rest in that. But gradually enables us to let go a little bit. You've got to feel safe, mm. I think. Mm. Uh, are there any mm. comments or questions? Because this isn't really meant to be me going on. Yeah. <laughs> Only me speaking. <laughs> um, it's meant to be more of a discussion. If there's mm. anything people would like to clarify, ask, offer, bring up. And if you want to do that verbally, you can raise your virtual hand. We'll unmute you, but not um, record your face, only your voice. Otherwise, you're welcome to write anything in the chat as well. Because I'm pretty sure this is a rich field. <laughs> Nothing coming yet. Do you want to say anything? Because you also like this song. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Once again, in monasteries, it happens. Oh, yeah. This is a classic. I'm sure in any organization, and I feel like uh, like Shirley, it, when I first heard the suit, it made a deep impression on me, because they're so simple, that's what's mm. the beauty of the Buddha's teachings, we all get it, and he puts into words what we kind of go like, oh, that's exactly what happens, we all pick up different stories, which are so true to us, I felt it, I saw it, I know it's like that. I saw it with my own eyes. <laughs> and yet you only saw part of the story. Mm. Yeah. yeah, like we didn't yeah. see the, whether that person slept last night. We didn't see, yes. you know, if they yes. just had an argument with somebody. Yes. This is especially yes. when they hurt us, isn't it? Yes. Or we yeah. didn't realize that we maybe felt particularly vulnerable that day. Right. Sometimes we're in a mood where everything right. makes us cry. Right. <laughs> Can I? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I recently... so this is um Perry from. Oh, sorry, I'm not meant to say your name. <laughs> <laughs> can I just check if you can hear? Hello. Did you hear that? Did everybody hear? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I recently um had a bit of a reaction to my boss at work, mm. and it was such a primal reaction because I think he threatened my safety mm. it was to do with my job and I've been swimming along in my job and it's been fine and then I changed departments and it's a different personality and he's very um very loud um you know and, and it's kind of that's not my way what I'm used to and he was very shouty, quite aggressive. And immediately my reaction was, that's not the way you speak to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's just not how you do it. <laughs> and I got really angry. Um, you know, like a sense of injustice it was. Mm -hmm. And I think that triggers me, a sense of injustice yeah. you know, when I see that. Mm -hmm. It really goes to the root and it's kind of like you know the reptilian brain has been mm, activated yeah. and the frontal cortex is gone yeah <laughs> and I'm just completely in an animal mode yeah yeah, yeah. and it's like my god this is a horrible man you know <laughs> and then I had to reflect after but it took quite some yeah. weeks mm. to then think okay mm. um you know where is he coming from mm. you know what was my situation I was a bit stressed yeah. because I've just started yeah. a new job and then I calmed down but it mm. took some time mm. to calm down mm. and it was um mm. I don't normally have such a strong reaction but it was yeah. 
a new job I yeah, felt unsafe yeah. Yeah. Right. sense of injustice and right. yeah, it completely right. made me emotional yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So did everyone hear that or do you want me to paraphrase? You yeah, could hear yeah. everything. That's fantastic. Great. So, yeah, that's really interesting. And I wonder, it's, I often also think of things in terms of, you know, the nervous system or the parts of the brain that are getting uh, activated. And it's interesting that you refer to that as your reptilian brain, because most likely he was in his. Uh, and that's often, isn't it, why people behave that way? Mm. I read recently that... Um, the more unsafe we feel, the faster we move, the faster we go. So when we feel unsafe, that's when we run around kind of being agitated and shouting mm. and, and it's like an attempt to feel safe. So this may have been what he was doing. And in the meantime, instead of being able to get the safety that way, they actually make everyone else in the same mood and also feel unsafe. So it, it's sad because it perpetuates it, but it's his nervous system that's dysregulated at that time. Mm. So it's really lovely that you were able to like step aside from it and then reflect. And I guess that's one of the things you're sharing with everyone, really, that it, it can help to do that mm -hmm. and to reflect that perhaps he's not a horrible man, but he's in a certain state of mind. And yeah, and you too, are, you know, more likely maybe to feel the impact of that because you're not yet safe in your new office or, or whatever. You're not used to that. Um, but yeah it's interesting isn't it to see our triggers you know when it, it's a sense of injustice or mm. yeah somebody's been wronged or mm. and yeah it's kind of very valid in a sense but I guess the thing is um having compassion for ourselves having compassion for that mm. that's a completely normal and human reaction mm. but then thinking how do I then gently turn my mind in a positive more wholesome direction so that I don't get stuck in in that reactivity yeah yeah mm -hmm. and I suppose having compassion for myself yeah so mm -hmm. you know I'm an organism mm -hmm. right and that's kind of yeah. how I'm going to react immediately. exactly and so yeah. it's kind of like, exactly. you know, don't be yeah. so hard on yourself yeah like exactly I often think to myself, you know, or I say to myself because I realize that one of the words I want to hear from my teachers like you didn't give me the right uh, comfort you know when I needed it so I'm like what did I want him to say then I realised what I actually wanted him to say or anyone to say in that sort of situation is, you know, it's completely natural. Anyone in your situation would feel like that. And that's what I want to tell to myself so often, you know, anyone in your situation would feel this way. And I actually think it's true. Because mm -hmm. I think everything we experience is conditioned. <laughs> if other people had exactly those conditions, they'd be experiencing the same effect. It's not personal at all. So yeah, depersonalizing is really good. Mm. Should we go to Sean and then we'll read from the box as well after that? Sean, may I ask you to unmute, please? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so it's it just yeah, I really like this Sita and this discussion really resonates with me and some sort of recent experiences, or certainly over the months. And the thing about perception, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, how you perceive things and that how that actually changes mm. the, can change an outcome. So first of all, I mean, the, what you were saying maybe about that boss and how, how they, um, you know, have that energy and then it transfers to other people. And I've noticed if I'm more positive, I think more positively and I notice positivity in others, I, there's more and more. There's like, it's like a compounding effect. Whereas when I focus on the negatives, I'm more negative and then I keep seeing the negatives. Um, there's, there's, you know, it's like the law of attraction. I don't know if people have, there's a book called The Secret and there's a film and there've been loads of books about this kind of thing. But it's so true, sort of, and that was, and you also mentioned about training your mind. So I, I obviously, like, we meditate, and that's one of the things, I guess, we're trying to do. But if we train ourselves, if you like, to be more positive, and I find with, you know, if you're the meta, uh, the letting go, it then helps not get so stuck in, 
I am right, my view, they are wrong, they did this wrong and be negative. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I just, and I've noticed the massive, like I, I put in the comment, I'm feeling more positive in these last few days because I'm making a real effort to be positive as well, but it's making me more happy. And mm. then I'm a few things have happened and I'm just like, oh, wow, that's amazing. This is great. And then the mm. other person says, yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's yeah. Like a, yeah. So, mm. um, yeah, I just think it's, it's really amazing because actually it's really quite simple. But mm. it, I'm not saying I'm perfect in any way. I very much, and especially in a work environment, can be very, it should be this way and you've done this wrong. So it's just about mm. catching myself before I go down mm -hmm. that route. Exactly. But, um, That's the thing. Because like you say, it's easy, but only if we remember to do it. <laughs> And I think that's why the Buddha speaks of mindfulness, not only of being aware of what's happening, but remembering the instructions, remembering what we're supposed to be doing, because you can only be, you can only kind of influence your mind when you're remembering that you can, <laughs> if that makes sense. So it's the mindfulness in the first place that remembers that. And the more we do it, the more we remember it as well, because we start getting that positive um, effect, the positive kind of uh, um feedback if you want so yeah and then I've, I've also found in my meditations recently I come out of them even more peaceful and positive mm -hmm. and then I'm looking forward to my meditation I'm not thinking oh I've got to meditate yeah. so again I think that that really yeah. helps yeah. yeah that's good thank you <laughs> remember that's impermanent too <laughs> <laughs> just to say that that's great and carry on but if it doesn't keep going that's not your fault <laughs> oh yeah that's <laughs> <laughs> okay should we read this one do you want to yes. um verbal communication often seems risky it's nice to be together in silence do nice things for each other talking is so overrated yeah talking is so overrated interesting yeah, and there's a time to talk and a time to be quiet. Mm. But you never know which one is which. <laughs> That's wisdom too, isn't it? <laughs> Knowing when to be silent, when to speak. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, it's yeah. about wisdom too. I agree, it's lovely doing things together in silence, doing mm. nice things. The, some of the most harmonious times are when you say on retreat, and I do this here like every year, I've done it twice anyways, Um mm two weeks silent retreats just with a couple of people who are used to doing completely self-sufficient silent retreats mm. and everybody just has their little job and we all just get on with it we don't talk we don't look at each other we just do little things somebody buys something nice for lunch or I can't buy something but I do little things like I try to find a nice talk for people to listen to or you leave a nice little note or and it's wonderful because you really notice the, the nice things we're doing. And you can always do something. Mm. You don't have to talk. It's true. Mm. But then I think sometimes it's important not to avoid it as well and to mm. take that risk. Because uh, there's so much you can do through words, so much harmony you can create, so much encouragement you can give, so much empathy and compassion you can express. But yeah, it's good to pause. I mean, that's something mm -hmm. we can all learn, I think, is to not just jump to speak, but to pause a little bit as well and to find the right mm -hmm. time. You know, the Buddha says there are five mm -hmm. methods, five aspects that you should check um, before speaking. And that's whether it's coming from a mind of loving kindness, whether it's true, whether mm -hmm. it's beneficial, whether it's the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the other one? whether it's said gently. So you have to actually say it gently, especially if it's feedback, right, of any kind. Mm. We were speaking with some nuns today because we had a visit from some nuns from Amravati, very junior nuns, and they came to see us, three of them, and it was really sweet. And they were saying about how they do have a lot of uh, uh, meetings and kind of community mm. decisions and discussions and everything kind of goes through these procedures there and it's really great because once they manage to talk through things it's difficult and it's not always easy it's sometimes unpleasant and triggering and all the rest but then by the time they come to a decision they've all made it together 
and no one can say oh I didn't want that to happen that was you that did it because they've all made it together so they have to take responsibility as a group and they have to say right okay we've made the decision maybe it wasn't right now we work it out we work how to make it work if you like so communication can be good well it's important it's a part of life so yeah right speech mm. there should be a right silence I guess that's <laughs> sama samadhi part of it anyway so yeah time for talking time for speaking and then to the next one okay in my work I care for persons with serious psychiatric illnesses and it's gone <laughs> hang on another one came in okay and I have no problem staying calm and don't get offended but the second I get home, I get triggered very easily of less kind things my family members say to each other. It's interestingly how interesting how differently you react in different situations. <laughs> oh, that's such a classic. We can forgive anybody saying any wild thing except our family. <laughs> Or the people that we're close to. Right. But Different that, expectations. Yeah. There's a similar story of uh, Ajahn Ram likes to tell mm. of the hus- wife who sends her husband off to get eggs. Yeah, that's a good one. And um, he comes back all riled up. Say, there was this awful man who abused me. He was just, you know, I got to the market and he said some really nasty things to me. I couldn't believe it, you know just racist and etc etc and the wife said oh that's just the local lunatic why are you listening to him and so he could go you know next time he went to get the eggs it did not bother him at all and just the 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 that's what we do right we take everybody so serious how could they have said such a mean and that's just wrong but uh, Ajahn Ram's story, the thing is that we are all really doing a text to stop, or rather thinking that uh, uh, we're all disarrayed to some degree or the other. Don't take people seriously, yeah. isn't it? And yeah. the Buddha also said that when people are like angry or whatever, they're like a sick person. Mm-hmm. They're actually not in their right mind at that time. And it's hard to be in your right mind even if you are in Dhamma, right? <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> so imagine the people who haven't been in Dhamma and they don't have the tools, they don't have the methods to calm themselves. And it's very difficult. I mean, I do think that's natural to get more triggered by family because obviously they know how to trigger you as well. <laughs> it's not just like random, right? They are sometimes kind of unintentionally, almost subconsciously know they're doing it. They just can't help it somehow. Mm-hmm. And I, it, the tragedy of that, in a sense, is that a lot of the time they're just trying to get your attention. They're actually trying to get a response to sort of get love, I think, mm. quite often. Mm. But we can't see it that way because they go about it in such a perverse sort of way. Mm. I don't know. Uh, but actually, sometimes they just want to see that they can affect you because mm. especially I found in the Dhamma, like if a parent feels you maybe you're going a bit distant from them, they want to know that you're going to cry when they when you say goodbye or something they're going to want to see that you're still upset you're still attached to them because they want to know that you Mm. kind of they're not losing you I don't know it's it's very very natural I think to be that way and also it could also be I think that you're so holding so much when you're at work Mm. there's only so much you can actually hold for other people so when you get home you probably want to relax and maybe you know you also can't really take too much more so Mm -hmm. yeah they probably don't realize it especially you've been under all day Mm -hmm. but yes it's interesting how different you react in different situations and yeah different with different people isn't it Mm -hmm. what did you say earlier today you said with family we know we can get away with it yeah (laughs) usually you won't get fired I think at work you also you know you've got to fit in haven't you you can't say too much otherwise you could get the fired yeah (laughs) exactly when you come home, you can let everything, your hair down, let loose. I have found that how your parents have decided that you're a certain way, and that's that. (laughs) Yeah. It can have a real effect on your whole life without you being aware of it. Yeah. I'm glad the Buddha teaches metta. 
and the awareness that everything changes and so do I yeah that's right because with people that we're around a lot of the time we get into these real sticky entrenched habit patterns and we seem to sort of act on autopilot and then you fix them they fix you they say oh yeah you always do that they expect you to do it before you do it so you're doomed really even if you don't do it they think you're doing it right I mean once somebody gets the idea that maybe you're a bit negative or oh or when somebody's tired um, they might be more grumpy then the minute they see you tired they'll react to you as if you're already grumpy even if you're not you know mm. <laughs> we just get fixed it's again trying to control mm. and make sense of the world mm. for a certain mm. survival thing so yeah it's very difficult when somebody's decided you're a certain way and that's that I actually think the relationship especially if they decided you're a negative way I, I think it's almost kind of spoiled Unless people are in Dhamma and can purposely train themselves to look mm. differently, it's very hard. You feel so fixed and there's no opportunity for you to show a different side. And it's actually the opposite of that, that I respect so much and feel so safe around my teacher for. Because with Ajahn Brahm, I mean, he doesn't have a fixed view of me. I know that. There is no self he's creating of me. If I ask him, what do you think of me or my qualities? Or I just say, well, you should know for yourself. He won't tell me. He'll praise things that you do, mm. the way you do things, but he won't say you are a such and such. Never, mm. never. Mm. And I feel completely free. I feel I can be any way. I mean, you saw me at the last trust meeting. He said, oh, I'm too tired. I don't want to do the two-minute meditation to start the meeting. I said, no, we're doing it. And he kind of did his big Ajahn thing. It's like, no, we, we'll skip that piece. I'm very tired and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I really held my ground. <laughs> And maybe other people thought that was really rude. But I know my teacher and I can do that. And afterwards I said, oh, I hope you didn't mind. He's like, no, sure. No problem. And I think he's probably quite glad I can I can do that, actually. So with these sorts of teachers, you feel you're free to try, you're free to experiment, you're free to grow, make mistakes, the works. Most of all, you're free to bloom. <laughs> and they're not threatened by that. Really beautiful, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm. So beautiful. So yeah, you need people who are going to give you a chance. And meta softens the mind, mm. it softens the heart, it softens the hindrances. Mm. So there's more chance to kind of look at things fresh. Meta is mm. so beautiful; it accepts us how we are, however we are. It doesn't even mm. try to pin us down. Yeah, everything changes, and so do we all the time. We're just a process. We just need care and nurture. Right. I had a manager who had a negative view of me. No matter what I did, it was incorrect. Mm -hmm. She had a fixed yeah. view. Oh, dear. So tiring. Yeah. I just feel so tired when I read that. I just feel we try so hard. You know, no matter how much you try in that situation, it's not going <laughs> to that person's view it's so tiring mm. uh, another thing Ajahn Brahm's really good at is he doesn't care what people think actually mm. but we're not um enlightened mm. by that mm. yeah <laughs> so, so Bill also had the same yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I feel that to yeah. some extent around people that luckily most of my relationships from childhood are really healthy and awesome I guess we don't mind it when someone has a fixed view of us as a good person. <laughs> that's the right view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the right view. But that's a more wholesome view that allows us to, to grow. Yeah, it's true. I mean, most people. And how many people do we have a fixed view of? <laughs> mm, true. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. When we hardly even know them, we're trying to figure them out, right? Mm. We really are. Mm. But then when you get to know a person, you see all these different sides of them. You sort of, at first, you, we measure people by ourselves, don't we? Mm. It's like if somebody's doing a certain thing, we think, well, they must be thinking this or feeling this because that's what I do when I'm feeling those things. Mm. But maybe it's different for them. Mm. Mm. I often find myself saying, well, I would, is that the right behavior? I wouldn't do it. You know, mm. I sort of tried to measure, like, is that yeah. stepping a boundary? Because I wouldn't do that. And sometimes that's helpful, but sometimes it's not the right measure. Yeah, yeah. 
You don't know their life. Right. Mm. I think the main thing is question. Don't believe your thoughts too much. Mm. Hold them lightly. Mm. Like rubber, not like rock. Mm -hmm. Hard, isn't it? I think. Mm -hmm. We've still got quite a bit of time. Should we go for the next one? You like this one. We all like this one. Let's go for it. It will add some richness to the cute of the day. Okay. Arguments among monks, monastics. Monastics, wherever monastics take to arguing and quarreling and fall into a dispute, stabbing each other with piercing words, I am uneasy even about directing my attention there, let alone about going there. I conclude about them. Surely, those venerable ones have abandoned three things and cultivated three other things. I have to say, this is a beautiful sutta because even the Buddha, you know, who is supposed to have absolutely no liking and disliking, he is compassionate and ex equanimous, all the rest. Even he, when he knows that there is um, disharmony somewhere, he doesn't want to go there. He doesn't want to um, even pay attention to them. So if the Buddha is sort of discouraged by disharmony, what of us? And so the importance of harmony in our lives. Isn't it true when you hear someone arguing? I mean, who? it hurts you, isn't it? It's something in your heart just, does, just, just hurts. But when there are kind words said, praise to each other. You're, it's, just some, it's just your mind leaps towards it. You, your heart opens. And so uh, the Buddha talks about, I mean, he, he really pulls this out as something that is important mm. to us as society, this harmony. Mm. So what are these three things that have been, that they have abandoned? There's another little play, play on, um, the, on his, on his uh, teachings because we often, the Buddha has asked us to abandon, the, abandon these things. But what have the, these monks abandoned? They have abandoned thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of benevolence and thoughts of non-harming. These are the three things they have abandoned. Isn't that beautiful? These are what we abandon when we take to um, yeah, having a little bit of a fight. <laughs> <laughs> we have abandoned non-harming. We have abandoned renunciation. And we have abandoned benevolence these things we have abandoned. And what are the three things they have cultivated? They, have, they are cultivating sensual thoughts, cultivating thoughts of ill will, and cultivating thoughts of harming. These are the three things they have cultivated. Isn't that so true? We want to get our way. We want to get back at them. We want a little bit of revenge to poke, <laughs> to hurt as they have hurt us. And so we abandon non-harming and we take up ill will and we take up harming. Mm. So these are the three things that they cultivate. Wherever monastics take to arguing and quarreling and falling and, and fall into a dispute, I conclude, surely those venerable ones have abandoned these three things and cultivated these three other things. Monks, wherever monks are dwelling in concord, harmoniously, without dispute, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with eyes of affection, I am at ease about going there, let alone about directing my attention there. I conclude, 
Surely those venerable ones have abandoned three things and cultivated three other things. What are the three things they have abandoned? They have abandoned sensual thoughts, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of harming. These are the three things they have abandoned. What are the three things they have cultivated? Thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of benevolence, and thoughts of non-harming. These are the three things they have cultivated. Where, wherever monastics are dwelling in concord, I conclude, surely those venerable ones have abandoned these three things and cultivated these three other things. Mm -hmm. So that's a beautiful sutta about the uh, about harmony being a measure of one's of a community's spiritual growth that if we can live in harmony when we have different opinions of how things should be and different parts of the elephant that we are holding on <laughs> to that we can still live in harmony and how do we live in harmony? Because we renounce, we renounce thoughts of harming. We, we go away from harm and we renounce, um, what is it? Thoughts of ill will. Thoughts of Ill will. Thoughts. And thoughts of sensuality. And we cultivate, we cultivate non-harming. We cultivate renunciation and we cultivate benevolence. Mm -hmm. so, Does that remind you of the another sutta? Does that remind anybody of another sutta? Vitaka Santana? Oh no, actually, it's Dvaita Vitaka, Majjhima 19, where the Buddha talks about dividing the thoughts into two kinds. On one kind, he sets aside, he puts thoughts of harming, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of sensuality. And on the other side, he puts thoughts of benevolence, thoughts of renunciation, mm -hmm. thoughts of non-harming, right? He says these are the three types of right thought. These are the three types of wrong thought. You could also mm -hmm. say intention, three right mm -hmm. intentions. It's exactly the same as the three right intentions. Second mm -hmm. factor of the eightfold path. Mm -hmm. And in that sutta, in the Dveda Vitaka, he actually says, that they cannot coexist. Basically, whenever you have a thought of sensual desire, you have abandoned thoughts of renunciation. Whenever you have a thought of ill will, you've abandoned thoughts of benevolence, thoughts of loving kindness. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have a harmful thought, you've abandoned thoughts of non-harming or compassion, gentleness. Mm -hmm. So they can't coexist, which sounds a bit scary if you're doing the wrong thoughts. But it's that mm. simple to replace them. And the next sutta talks about that. The Majjhima number 20 talks about substitution. So you can actually replace a thought of harm with a thought of loving kindness. And that's one of the powerful things about loving kindness, that we can mm. change our thought patterns. At first, it's like a thought only, right? So you think, well, I don't really mean it, but at least I can think it. <laughs> Feels a bit artificial. But it actually at least protects your mind from an, a thought of ill will because it's impossible to have a thought of ill will at the same time, which is one of the reasons why it's, I think, a really powerful way to start off the meta practice, because you're actually clearing away any possible thoughts of ill will at that time and allowing for meta to at least to begin to arise. Sometimes I find if the ill will is strong enough, however much you try and practice meta, mm. it's just like... Yeah, you just want to be upset. That's true. But what if you have a thought of metta? Not necessarily sit down and practice, but you know, like Kerry was saying, okay, maybe you can't do it at the time, but afterwards you think about it differently. Or, or sometimes you're just trying to push it away. Yeah. And then actually it just keeps really ugly. Worse. Yeah, it gets worse. 
But I think if you give it time and you find the right time mm. to like look at it from a different angle, because a thought of meta doesn't necessarily mean may you be happy. Mm. It might just be a, a thought that's maybe more like compassion, like mm. maybe they were tired mm. or maybe I misunderstood mm. or maybe they did mean it, but hey, they're suffering. Mm. That's true. You know, that's, that's also true. a sort of meta. That's true. That's true. Because I think. It's true. reflection actually in this way is a part of the practice and the buddha yeah. says you can have thoughts like this not only when you're with a person but in private as well in fact he says we should have thoughts of loving kindness in mm. public and in private mm. so even if you can't do it at the time mm. you can go back and ponder mm. and i think you do that quite a lot mm, mm, mm. Ajahn Brahmali does that quite a lot mm. yeah. i guess we all mm. do it to a degree i think you can even do it through speaking to someone you trust you can say, what do you think they meant? Maybe they didn't mean that, you know? Mm. Should we look at it differently? Maybe how do we address it so, you know, in a skillful way? That's also kind of. But it's true, we shouldn't just suppress mm. as well. Perhaps sometimes yeah. a thought of compassion can be to ourselves and our own feeling of anger. Right, right, right. Because it's kind of miserable being yeah. angry, isn't it? Right. So sometimes instead of like saying, I shouldn't be angry, I shouldn't be, you know, having this thought, it's like, okay, what's happening yeah. here? This is painful. Let me kind of find how I can be with this in a gentle way. That's also mm. a sort of compassion towards mm. anger. Mm. I think that can mm. help. Mm. Can I just add? Because mm. I also, I think what you're saying is, you know, resonates because sometimes it takes time, doesn't it, for something mm. to discharge itself. That mm. you've got that immediate kind of anger mm. or reaction, mm. but it, it's not going to go straight away. Mm. Um, especially if it's really affected you mm. and it runs deep, mm. and it will take time mm. to go. Right. And yes. Yeah. That might not even be that day. It might right. not even be the right. next day. Right. Yeah, it takes time to process. Take, right, right, right. It takes time to process. Yeah. And I think it's important to be aware that what we're trying to do is to understand, not to make it go away. The goal is not to make it go away, actually. The goal is to turn our mind towards thoughts and mm. feelings and mental states that are more wholesome, but not to make it go away. Rather to genuinely be able to handle it in a skillful way. And as a result, it will probably go away. But it's not that we do it to make it go away. And I think that's maybe the danger with the idea of trying to replace it because you don't like it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're doing it to make it go away, it's not actually meta. Like meta is actually including everything, accepting everything, right? Including the anger and everything. Because meta, I always think of it in two ways. Like, I mean, this is talking about thoughts, which I think is also one way, but. I think you can do meta as a cultivation, which is when you're in the right mood. But you can also do meta as an attitude to your experience. And that might be meta towards anger or meta towards fear, meta towards, you know, anxiety. Which means just learning how to be with it in a skillful way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to yeah, this yeah, one. Probably yeah. five I want to make sure everyone's spoken who wants mm -hmm. to speak as well. When I have those negative thoughts, they're masking feelings of fear mm -hmm. or insecurity. Yeah, true, true, great true, 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 that you can true. notice that. True. So yeah, often exactly. that's what anger's it's about. Just, it's just feeling scared. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. We yeah. are being threatened. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, it's kind of easier to have negative thoughts which make you feel solid. Mm. this is one of the reasons I think people get into anger because it makes you feel very solid when mm. you're actually out of control like the other day I got quite sort of quite enjoyed it in a sort of I have to admit getting angry with the heating system because <laughs> I really don't like it and I want to make a point that it's a crazy heating system and it's completely out of control but then that makes me feel less kind of ah, about it you know <laughs> I'm like ah, I need to do that <laughs> it's not really anger because it's just me being a bit too expressive but but <laughs> But uh, yeah, I suppose at that time it does make me feel a bit righteous and a bit like, see, I knew it was difficult. It re reasserts my view that the heating system is terrible in this house. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's really nice if you can actually go to those other feelings mm -hmm. underneath it when you feel safe and when you feel you have mm -hmm. 
yeah the space mm. because they're much softer although they're a bit more scary you feel a bit less mm. solid a bit more out of control perhaps they're actually mm. much softer mm. and more productive of compassion maybe mm. fear and insecurity you feel small you feel kind of oh I need a hug or mm. whatever mm. I think it's really good to learn to ask for these things as well especially maybe for guys I don't know Girls do it quite a bit. This is a bit of a generalisation, but I think it's true. They're, yeah, I'm just reading this. That's why we need to offer thoughts of kindness and compassion to ourselves. Yes, mm. exactly. So do you want to speak, Bill? Uh, Bill, may I ask you to unmute, please? I got it. Can you all hear me? Just not yep. ahead. So you hit the nail on the head. For me, part of why I follow you and I lean towards female monks because I grew up in a very machismo, to, to uh, a very male dominated culture. I only have brothers. Father was Scotch Irish, very rough. So I went to all boys high school. All my friends are male. I find I'm rough. I can be very rough, um, which is not society. And so I, everything you're talking about, and when you said particularly males, it speaks right to the heart for me, you know. So instead of showing fear or insecurity, I show anger mm -hmm. or I'm short or I'm curt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so part of my practice is to find the softer side yeah. of Buddhism, and I find that particular a lot with and why I really enjoy female monks because I need that balance in my life. Yeah, I need to cultivate that. Yes, yeah, because I see that as a shortcoming because I just say what I think, which many times hurts me. Yeah, it's wonderful that you know that that you have that awareness, and um, I think it's also important. Have you? I'm not sure you're not speaking, right, Bill? Because sometimes it comes in and out. I hope I'm not interrupting you. No. All right. Yeah. Now, just to say that um, it's wonderful that you have that awareness, you know, mm -hmm. of what can soften those edges. And also, I think, to have the awareness that these things are not intrinsically male or female. It's male. It's being socialized as a male in a patriarchal culture. You know, it's not actually who any of us are, right? Whether we show more stereotypically feminine or masculine qualities. It's the way we've been socialized, the way we've been brought up. So even that is not who you are, you know, it's something that can change. Um, but there's a lot of pressure on men. And I think that's something that we don't, or we're not always aware of, you know, especially if men are in sort of generally more privileged positions in society, we think, oh, it's all right for them. It's the other people who are oppressed. But we're all kind of, we all suffer from these kind of, get up and go kind of competitive societies that maybe are more patriarchal, also very capitalistic, right? So many different sides to them. Um, we all suffer, we all need much more kindness. We've also been socialized like that to some degree. So yeah, yeah, maybe women are generally, it's maybe seen a little bit more acceptable for us to talk about emotions because people think we do that all the time anyway, so we might as well. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, it's it's hormonal as well because we had a trans person in our community and um, she was taking estrogen and she just, it was so fascinating telling us and sharing so much of um, her journey as trans female and noticing that with the estrogen, she was just so much more emotional and emotionally connected as well and felt so, her emotional life was richer. And I was like, seriously, this is about hormones. This is incredible. You know, it's just all a conditioned process. So anyway, just to say that I hear that struggle and it's great that you know what can balance it, but just remember it's not you, it's not fixed. That's why the damage is that, is that the piece of non-self? I think that so. I, that I struggle definitely, with? definitely a piece of non-self. To me, the easiest way into non-self is to think of it ourselves, <laughs> not ourselves, not as ourselves, but as just um a whole mass of causally arisen conditions or how else could you say it everything we experience is dependently arisen dependently originated 
by so many things, socialization, maybe genetics, if past lives, maybe hormones, maybe astrology even could be a piece of it. I mean, so many things. We're just iPhones. We're just iPhones. <laughs> There's your piece for the day. We could call this sort of discussion with just iPhones. I don't even have an iPhone. I'm not an iPhone. iPhone. Phony eyes. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> yes. No, I think it is a piece of non-self. Ajahn Ram's always saying he can't help the jokes he tells because his father told bad jokes. So that's his get out clause. But there's something to it. You know, it's not that we don't take responsibility. If we don't do that, then we won't change, right? But definitely to see that it's a causal process and what causes can we put in place to help us move towards wholesome states that's mm -hmm. important i'm going to read out the last mm -hmm. comments because there are people who haven't yet spoken and then we're going to close thank you very much bill it's lovely to hear that and i'm sure that helps many other people here mm -hmm. okay so yeah another person female said i learned it was not okay for me to express any emotions so cruel in a way isn't it that sort of message I chose peace as my primary life objective so when there's some disruption peace comes to mind quickly and tension melts away wow that's great there's one person in my home that gets into arguments with people often and talks over people sometimes I ask myself is it better to challenge my patience and practice metta while being around that person or is it better to avoid that person? Just quickly, because we don't have much time, I'd say some of both, depending on the time. Mm. Don't completely ignore them unless it's really toxic. But don't always try to practice that around them either. Respect mm. your limits. I've practiced to stay calm and not react with anger when I'm with that person, but I still notice physiological impacts on my body, increased heart rate, respiration mm. rate, mm. etc. Yeah, it might be not enough to try and stay calm and not react with anger when you're with them. I think it's maybe more about practicing a lot of meta in your daily life. I mean, it depends who this person is, whether you can actually, uh, you know, in your home. So it might be a good practice just to do a lot of meta generally. It protects you, it protects them, and it takes you to the path. You know, it doesn't take you off the path. You can get all the way into jhana, samadhi, the works. It might be good to practice that because to only practice staying calm and not reacting when we're with someone. Um, by then, it's really you're in the fight. You're in the kind of what do you call it? In the fire jaws of the tiger. The jaws of the tiger. I don't know. Yeah. So it's an ongoing process. Ah, that's really tough mm. if they're in your home. I mean, of, over time, consistent kindness to that person will help. Consistent calmness, maybe not saying anything when they're being that way, kind of maybe not engaging, maybe also leaving their company pretty quickly. And then when they're not like that, showing them the opposite, really, really praising, encouraging, telling them how nice it is to spend time with them. And that's called like positive reinforcement. So that's one something that some psychologists kind of recommend, you know, that you don't kind of blame the bad behavior. You just kind of disengage a little bit, maybe move away or read a book. Or I don't know what. And sometimes when they are in a better mood or even if they listen for a moment or don't shout very loudly, you could say, isn't it, you know, it's really nice when we can have a discussion or I don't know what, what you can do, but um, definitely try to um, practice a lot of meta for yourself. Not just for this other person. Meta is just meta. You don't have to bring them into it because they're obviously going to be the difficult person. Just practice meta probably for yourself or for a loved person, somebody easy, somebody you feel safe with. Make that part of your regular practice, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have to experience increased heart rate and respiration, I mean, learn to observe it just objectively without worrying about it because you're not going to die mm -hmm. and sometimes we see these things oh, I, I, I don't like this it's terrible look at what's happening but if we can actually just be aware of those sensations and try to open to them stay calm with them and respect if you have to walk away then uh, they may start to bother you less and less I don't know anything else on that 
There's actually two minutes yeah. left. A bit too long. All right. So um, I think Manoi is going to say a few words and then we're going to say a few more about the summer. <laughs> and not the weather. Yeah. Oh, just about thinking about the weather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to tell about the weather, but just going to remind all of us that today's Sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. So I put the link of the website's donation page. And if you are able to do any contribution that is going purely for the, the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project, for the charity, for the Vihara maintenance, uh, and, and all the improvements, the education and the, the meditation and the, 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 that both the venerables are doing with the help of lots of other, uh, you know, other people and uh, other monks and nuns. Um, so if you are able, please um, uh, donate whenever you are able and uh, until end of June, we still have the food dana. If you want to uh, uh, do a food dana, you can email team at anukampaproject.org. And we still uh, like to have volunteers. And there's a, a very detailed piece about what kind of volunteers we need uh, in, the, in the website. So if you like to volunteer with Anukampa Project, go and have a look at it. Uh, you don't have to be in Oxford. Uh, there are so many other ways of volunteering, uh, uh, depending on your skills. Uh, and also, uh, I'm not going to talk about the food dana because we've got only about a month uh, and about the events. There's, um, lo there, there's few events, quite a few events actually in the website uh, the, up to end of November because uh, on the 17th, there's uh, both venerables uh, having a meta retreat in Cambridge. Oh, forgiveness. With... Pardon? Forgiveness retreat. Oh, forgiveness. Sorry, not meta. Wisdom of forgiveness, yeah. Uh, and uh, then uh, we have all the details of Ajahn Brahm's tour uh, in the events. Uh, so have a look at the events page. And if you have not subscribed to the newsletters, you can do that as well through the through the website. So you get the latest newsletters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manori. Uh, so uh, just to add to that, that uh, we actually only have 10 or so days left, 10, 11, 12, maybe days but you can come and offer Dana for now. And after that, I'm going to be away. Venable Upeka will be going back to Australia. I'll be going on retreat uh, for the whole summer until November. And in my absence, we're going to have a weekly program, but not the sort of discussion that I want to wait for because I love to do this and finish it off with you afterwards. Um, but I've asked quite a few bikinis and also... A certain monk to teach uh, <laughs> to teach over those months and there's almost one a week actually which is going to be wonderful starting July the 2nd or so and different bikunis each week some weeks have also a peer some months have a peer-led session which means you come to the group and they'll play a little talk probably by me or probably by me and uh, <laughs> in case you miss me maybe and um, then you'll have like a little discussion together. You'll have some meditation together. And it's like a chance for you to talk together, um, led by either Shirley or Leah. But otherwise, there'll be a bikini each week. So that will be in the newsletter and also on the website before I leave, before the end of June. So that's it. And yes, the retreat on the 17th is in Cambridge and it's called the Wisdom of Forgiveness. There's still some space if you can make it. Um, and it's the only, first and only, we'll be doing together for a day retreat this time. Mm -hmm. So after that, we have to ask Venerable Pekka to visit again. <laughs> okay, so I think that's it. So if you wish, you can unmute yourself. The recording will stop and we can wave goodbye. <laughs>